Uh, my name is Jared Nielsen. Um, I have a, my background is in visual arts, and so I thought this was a really interesting. Well, uh, and I currently teach um, full stack web development at George Washington University. So I made this very interesting career trajectory from two degrees in visual arts. I made the foolish, foolish decision of getting an MFA. If any of you are thinking about doing that, don't do it. <laughs> don't do it. So I made that bad, bad decision of doing that. Found myself now doing full stack web development. Because it doesn't matter what degree you get, you're going to be doing full stack web development. <laughs> <laughs> it's true, true story. <laughs> so I thought, because this is the inaugural art plus code, I would share with you my journey from art to code and some of the problems that I, and challenges and joys I encountered along the way. Um, the title of this is, We Have Always Been Hackers, and that's because since the dawn of humankind, we have always been hackers. It doesn't matter what tools we are working with, we just grab them, we hack them, we make something happen. But that is more true for artists than anyone else working professionally or non-professionally. All right, so in the beginning was the command line. Um, and for me, that was a very easy transition because my first computer was the Texas Instruments 99.4A, of which Bill Cosby was the spokesman. Isn't it weird today to see him touching that computer? <laughs> so this is actually more like my family with the computer. Uh, all right. After the TI-99-4A became obsolete, which it had a really limited run, um, like most Americans, we transitioned to a Windows PC. And I was in love with Sierra's King's Quest games. And this is how I got immersed in computers. It's just loading up floppy disk after floppy disk. I don't know if anyone played these games, anyone had a computer in the 80s, but in order to install a game, it wasn't like you just plugged in a cartridge. The game shipped in a very, very large box, and it was at least five, if not like 10 floppy disks. And you had to copy all the contents of each of those floppy disks to your PC, then run the install, and then you could play the game. So it took like a day to get your game installed so that you could then play it. Anyway, this is King's Quest. Really lo-fi graphics, amazing game series. Um, so when I was a young whippersnapper, with my parents' PC, that's when I first started learning basic and a little bit of C. And I am very sure that all the problems that occurred with my parents' Windows computer were my fault. Because I was hacking it and doing things I should not have been doing. And it was always, always something wrong with it. But that's how I got my hands dirty. So I'm very sorry, Mom and Dad. Uh, but I am very grateful for that sort of introduction to um, computer science, very hands-on introduction to computer science as a child. So when I got to art school, well first let me say I grew up in a very, very small town in Utah. So my high school, um, there were basically no science classes and it emphasized um, sports. And that was basically your only way out of where I grew up is if you played football. You can judge by my physique that I was not a football player. So I had to find other means of getting myself out of small town Utah. So I went to art school. So I had, I was very good at drawing, very good at painting, and I was accepted to Massachusetts College of Art in Boston, which is the only state-funded art school in the nation, so my tuition was very, very cheap. When I got there, um, I decided painting sucked, and I wanted to work with all this cool digital media, and bought myself uh, this MacBook Pro, this G4. This was my first computer that I purchased for myself. And the thing was a tank. It was, it was built solid aluminum. Even the keys were aluminum. Everything about it was just like indestructible. And I pushed it so hard for about four years until one day it just gave up the ghost. So then I bought the, the new MacBook that had just come out. And it was a major step down from the G4s. And it cost almost twice as much. And then it frequently asked me to update the operating system, and at that time I had to shell out 100 bucks every time I needed to upgrade the operating system, which is nothing to sneeze at when you're a poor artist. So 
And then the next Apple iteration that came out was an even lower step downs, like the one I'm using is like the worst MacBook I've ever set my hands on. But my employer paid for this, so it's cool. <laughs> so I went, so in undergrad, I was doing a lot of really bad video art using my, my G4. So this is one of my, uh, my video art installations. Two heads are better than one. Any friend of yours is a friend of mine. Birds of a feather flock together. The more we learn, the less we know. Curiosity killed the cat. There's more than one way to skin a cat. All right, that goes on and on and on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I was really into um, infinite loops with video production, so that this is more or less a seamless loop. If you, you could watch this for hours, if you're really into maxims and adages and how there's never any truth to any statement. All right. Um, so that's what I was doing in undergrad. But again, when I left undergrad, there's not a lot of options, like employment options out there for a young video artist. So I made the unfortunate mistake of going to graduate school. And I went to the University of California, Irvine, which might be the worst graduate school in the country. So um, in between then, though, this was the moment when it was becoming very important for artists to have a web presence. And it was interesting to see Meg's evolution of her websites as she was proceeding through her uh, I don't know, education in web development. So I was teaching myself HTML and CSS, a little bit of JavaScript, so I could have a website that I was just throwing together ad hoc and serving on Bluehost at the time. Yeah. Um, so this, was my, this is my very, very first web application I'll show for you here. Uh, although my screen resolution is crazy right now. Um, so this is a random uh, sort of New York New Yorker cartoon generator. So the images are from a passenger safety pamphlet, but the taglines, the, the punch lines are from New Yorker magazines, from the comics in New Yorker magazines. So the images are randomly paired with New Yorker uh, punchlines. <laughs> All right. Mm. Let me find my slide deck again. OK, so that was my first web app. Um, then I went to grad school. The best thing that happened to me in grad school is I met Babette Mangold in a studio visit. I don't know if anyone knows who Babette Mangold is, but she's a very, very famous avant-garde filmmaker. She's from France, hang out with the Cinema Verite people, got fed up with that scene, moved to New York, started hanging out with all the avant-garde dancers. I met her through Yvonne Rayner, um, and we hit it off immediately. And she was telling me, oh, and I was showing her some of the video stuff I was working on at the time. She was telling me about how she was learning C because she was fed up with all of the digital tools that were available to her as an artist. Because what she was noticing is that all the effects that Avid and Final Cut, because those are the two big editing suites at the time, all the effects that they, that she was provided looked like everything else everybody else was doing. And she wanted to create something that was unique and different and didn't exist anywhere else. The things that no one had ever seen before using code. So she started learning C to write her own video effects. And I was like, that's crazy. This old lady is showing me up. She's writing C to create video art that no one is, has ever seen, to do things that no one has ever thought of with video. So, and it's true, at that time, because Avid and Final Cut were the an iMovie, really, but iMovie is garbage then. So everybody's using Avid and Final Cut. Everything looked the same. You could tell. You watched a documentary, you watched a film or something, you could tell if it was cut with Avid or Final Cut because the quality of the video, if things were still pixelated back then. It wasn't HD. You could tell what, how, what it was cut with, and you knew what tools they used to make certain things. 
swipes, effects, everything. It was all cookie cutter, and it was really, really boring. Um, so, oh yeah, so anyway, so Mangle though, the thing that was interesting about her is that when she started as a filmmaker back in the 50s or 60s, when she started making her first films, she was cutting and splicing them together with a razor blade and tape. Like she had like hands-on investment with the material that she was working with. Me as a video artist in the 2000s, I had no connection to the materials that I was using. I would grab a video camera, I'd plug a mini DV in, yeah, this is when mini DVs, plug a mini DV in, record something, transfer that over to Final Cut, and then I had this total disconnect between the thing I was working with and then the output. I didn't understand anything between point A and point B. So then I started asking myself this question is like, what does it mean when the means of artistic production are abstracted? What does it mean when you're an artist and you don't understand how the tools you're using make the thing that you're using? So what does that mean for the output of that art? If you're operating in this proprietary system, are you actually connected to your artwork or is that artwork totally divorced from the actual intent of what you think it is? Especially when that the means of production are owned by some sort of large conglomerate like Apple that sometimes does unsavory things in the world and the only way that you can put something out into the world is to use some sort of tool that they've given to you. So for the most part I was using pirated copies of all my software so I didn't feel too bad about that. <laughs> but I did start really thinking about this question that, Bab that Babette put to me. So here we have the, like the, one of the first, if not the first tool that humankind ever used, like a, a stone axe. And our ancestors carried this with them every day because they needed it for everything they were doing. If they were chopping down a tree, if they were skinning an animal, if they were killing each other, they needed something like this. Here's a tool that we, many of us, carry every day, this iPhone 5. Um, so here's a, a sort of schematic diagram of the iPhone 5 build. What do we see is the difference between this and this? I'm a teacher, so I'm putting this to you. <laughs> I'll give you the answer. We can't build this, right? We, none of us in this room could build an iPhone 5. But we could probably go out and like chip a stone to build some sort of tool. Like We could, for the more, most part, create this object as we needed it for ourselves if we needed to. But this, the means of production from this are totally abstracted. We have no idea how an iPhone 5 works. There are a lot of smartphones out there that we do know how they work, uh, but they're like sort of very niche, bespoke, cottage phones. So if anyone's familiar with uh, the maker movement and the maker manifesto, one of the tenets of the maker manifesto is if you can't open it, you don't own it. And when this, the, maker, the maker movement was sort of emerging while I was in graduate school. So I was thinking about a lot of things I was seeing, like Cory Doctorow. I think this may be Cory Doctorow's phrase. I don't know if anyone reads Cory Doctorow. If you read Boing Boing, you know who Cory Doctorow is. Anyway, maker movement emerged. This big rush to sort of open source everything, to make everything freely available to anyone who wanted to build anything they wanted to. Also at the same time, this book was released by Richard Sennett, the craftsman. He's sort of like a proto-Marxist sociologist, and this book is his sort of investigation into craft and why anyone obsesses with the craft of anything. Why does a craftsperson really pursue quality to some sort of absurd degree when it's at a detriment to their bottom line? A lot of craftspeople they could probably make more money if they weren't so concerned with the craft side of it. But there's something about the craft side of it that is like quintessential or like very essential to the process of building something. And there are two main takeaways from this book is that making is thinking. So when you're making something, it's a way of addressing philosophy with your hands. Like you're thinking through things hands-on in this very hands-on way. The other thing that he came to, because he's a proto-Marxist, is that learning to work well enables people to govern themselves and so to become good citizens. So he was kind of like hinting at just like 
government overthrow, everyone goes back to making craft, and then we'll all live peaceably. Right? Okay. So these are the two tenets of The Craftsman by Richard Sennett. In that book, though, he talked endlessly about Linux. And if anyone here uses Linux, is familiar with Linux, Linux is entirely open source. It's built collaboratively by an international group of developers. So the majority of the world's servers, 90% if not more of those servers, are running on Linux. It was initially brought into the world by Linus Torvalds. He couldn't maintain it by himself, started bringing on collaborators. It spread far and wide. But the thing about Linux developers, kernel developers, is that they obsess over the craft. They want their Linux kernel to be optimized. It's, they want it to be the best sort of operating system in the world. And that's why it's the de facto server operating system is because it's so fantastic. So I built, I took the plunge. I built my first Linux rig with Ubuntu. And needless to say, my artistic production bottomed out. I didn't make anything for years because it was really overwhelming to dive into Linux and try to make things the way I had initially thought I was going to make things. Anyway, I got caught up to speed. I started learning things like Open Frameworks, which is an open source framework built on C++, meant for artists to like really quickly get some sort of interactive um, project up to speed. And I, had a, I was living in Los Angeles at the time, and so I had a residency at the Institute of Cultural Inquiry. And um, the Institute had this really amazing collection of 45s and vintage record players. And so I would, while I was hanging out there in my residency, I'd throw the record players on and um, let them play. But because there was only one song on each side, they would get to the end really quickly. And at the end, you get this awesome end skip. It would just play like this. So I would do something in the studio and find that I liked the end skip better than the music that was on the record. So I took all the 45s, photographed both sides, recorded the end skips of both sides, and then mashed them together. So this is a web app now. But back, in the, back 10 years ago when I did this project, the, uh, the capability to do this online wasn't there. there was, the web audio interface was terrible. It was really limited to certain browsers. Programming this with JavaScript was a nightmare. So I used open frameworks, and it took me several weeks. I recently revisited this, and it took me 15 minutes. So the, so the pace of technology changes really rapidly. And we can now do much more with code than we could just a few years ago. Uh, it goes on and on and on. OK. Where is it? <laughs> Shh. All right, so at that time, I was also working at the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles as an exhibit tech. Because when I graduated grad school, this was 2009 on the bottom of the economy. And I was just really lucky to get anything. And I just landed in like the best job ever, where I got to like be a maker and tinkerer all day long. So this is a photo of me setting off a, a balloon mapping experiment we were doing of the campus at the Natural History Museum. And I took all the images from this and then stitched them together using Huggin, which is an open source um, photo stitching platform. Um, while I was there, the biggest project I undertook was installing this massive, massive city model of Los Angeles that had been created in the 1940s. And this thing was super, super delicate. The curators, the registrars were so nervous about anything breaking on this because it was irreplaceable. There, we couldn't afford anything to go wrong with this. Uh, here's a detail of it. So that's that city hall in Los Angeles at super, super tiny scale. So because the curators were totally freaked out and didn't trust any of their techs, because we were just a bunch of thugs, a bunch of ruffians, I decided I would learn this open source program called Blender and walk them through, guide them through the build process of how I was going to take this very delicate city model and put it into this million dollar glass case. Because the case itself had been shipped from Germany. 
um, because only the Germans can build a million dollar glass case. And um, I, this is sort of like the build process here that I, I rendered this in Blender. I'd never done any 3D animation before. This is entirely open source software. And um, when the registrars and curators saw how thoughtful I was in this procedure, they were OK with us proceeding with this because they got to see how it was all going to happen in real time and not just sort of anecdote about moving these pieces in. So that's one side of the city model. So the city model was in two separate pieces that had to be joined in the middle and then moved inside the glass case. All right. We don't need to watch the whole thing. So I, while I was in Los Angeles, I convinced my younger brother to move to Los Angeles. I also convinced him to switch over to Linux, which he immediately fell in love with because as a web developer, yes, he was smarter than me. He went into web development before I did. He uh, switched to Linux, absolutely loved it, and found that his workflow improved tenfold, if not hundredfold. Like, he absolutely loved it. So in conversations about open source software, about the maker movement, et cetera, we hatched this ridiculous plan to create a web series where using puppets we would teach computer science basics. So this is one of my favorite episodes of the Hello World program where I built the, these two robots. I refer to them as Kraft Punk. And they're going to teach powers of two. So I'm going to let this play. I'm going to gauge the audience. When I see your eyes glaze over, we're going to move on. <laughs> Two bytes of data. Mwahaha. <laughs> Four bytes of data. Mwahaha. <laughs> Eight bytes of data. Mwahaha. Sixteen bytes of data. Mwahaha. I'm not going to say it. I do. We are not going to fight about this, okay? Guido, I've told you before, I'm a lover, not a fighter. <laughs> Besides, we don't need any of these cheap gimmicks to appeal to the masses. How are we supposed to teach Powers of Two if you don't play along? Once my rap videos go viral, we'll be more popular than the Beatles. Refresh my memory. This would be a lot easier if you had watched the videos in order. I'm more of a kinesthetic learner. I've got just a video for you. Come on, everybody. Do the binary dance with me. When I say one, raise your arms above your head like this. One, zero, one, zero, one, zero, and one, zero. Good. Now we're going to shake it up. Relax your arms and rotate your body at the hips. This isn't educational, but it looks hilarious. Bonjour, Earth Puppets. We are currently orbiting the Hello World. Uh, big deal. Our planet is um, funky and obsolete. We saw your impressive MC skills in the previous episode. You've got all the things we really needed to save our dying world. I told you my videos would go viral. I'd love to share my funk, but there's more to it than that. Funk is in my very circuits. I'm funky on a mathematical level. Explain. First, you must understand the power of two. All good things come in twos. They omen Cristo and Bongalter, Flansburg and Lino, Barth and Fielding, or Guido and ID. Or ID and Guido. So what ID is saying is, one bit of computed data has two possible values, zero or one. Or one and zero. Adding another bit of data doubles our maximum potential values. So. Two bits of data may contain four possible combinations, and three bits of data doubles that again to as many as eight, or two to the power of three. Blimey, I do love math. Yeah, Python is a good calculator. This is not funky. Patience, young grasshopper. The journey of 1,024 bytes begins with a single bit. We can make a byte with eight bits of data. This byte, is it funky? Very. 
One byte of data provides 256 possible binary arrangements, or the values 0 through 255. Imagine a song with only one beat. If you are a human connected to an EKG, this is music to your ears. But for robots like us, it's totally boring, right? That is correct. If every note within an 8-note Dorian scale can have two states, off or on, then we can create 256 variations on this song, but it's still not very funky. Adding just one beat doubles our potential arrangements. Magnifique! No, that's a polka. Polka is not cool? No, polka is not cool. We need to increase the power of our song one more time to get four beats. This is, how you say, four on the floor? Yes, disco gave birth to electronic dance music and the home computer revolution. In the spirit of Moore's Law, let's increase our power again. The beats, they increase exponentially. Pew, pew. What do you think of our post-disco boogie baseline? It's I. If you're making hard drives or storage, let's double back. This baseline is bad. Yo, agreed. But if we want to go platinum, we need to add more instruments. Say bon. Wee oui, wee. Oui. All that's missing is a vocal hook. The hello world, the hello world, the hello world, the hello world. Alright. <laughs> Thanks for indulging me. <laughs> so my brother and I attempted that series using entirely open source software, and it was very, very difficult. Um, we had to make compromises and use um, software that would run on Linux, but it was not entirely open source. So the video editing was like the major uh, pain point for us, where there just isn't a good open source video editing platform available. And so we had to use um, Lightworks, which they pr had promised for years and years they would open source, and they never did and still never have. So it was almost like 99% open source, that entire production, um, but we fell a little bit short. So shortly after that, we were contracted to, by Local Motors in National Harbor to build a scale model artistic interpretation, 3D printed interpretation of Washington, DC. Uh, so here's a shot of it. And I'll play the um, build process while I talk about it. So for this, we did use entirely open source software for this. We, and we tried to use entirely open source 3D printers for this too but just found that the Lowell's bots we were using were not adequate for the level of production that we needed to create because we had to print out, I think, about 600 3D models for this build. Um, but all the models we designed in Blender and all of the laser cut um, uh, terra terraforming that we did was all done with Inkscape, which are all open source software and all run natively on Linux. Um, and the majority of the laser cutting was done in the Fab Lab at MLK, uh, which is now closed for renovation. But I do think they have a pop-up container opening somewhere. So if you are interested in laser cutting, go to the library's website. You can get into it. Um, yeah, all right here. Let me skip ahead so we can see the end of this. Anyway, as it comes together, Here's the model. Uh, and then we start adding all the, the 3D models, all the laser cut, whatever. All right, those are what some of the models look like close up on all the laser cut um, materials. OK, so that project nearly killed us uh, because we had 30 days to pull that off, and local motors didn't give us the green light on our design until seven days before the deadline. So we built that in seven days. Um, so yeah, by the end of that, we were like, let's not work professionally together anymore. Let's just be family. Uh, and so I've like kind of scaled back and just been playing with some more simple projects. 
Um, so there's kind of this awesome thing happening now in web development where machine learning is starting to be introduced into the browser. So I built my first machine learning app using Brain.js. And this app will take in any quote and then determine whether or not it's more like Samuel Beckett or more like Yogi Berra. So does anyone want to throw out a phrase, a statement, anything? Michael's got one. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to run that. Brain.js is calculating there in the browser. Let's hope this works, because sometimes it doesn't. Ah, it's more like Samuel Beckett. Yeah, so there we go. <laughs> uh, all right, so nearing the end here. So one of the things that I've realized in trying to work with code as an artist is that bringing art and code together is a constant challenge. <laughs> I'm glad that the, de the developers in the room get the pun. I just couldn't resist. It writes itself, right? So it constant challenge, art plus code. Um, and Something, as I've been working with this for years, that I, I think about and realize is that code is not magic. Regardless of what Gabe Newell tells you in those, those promotional videos when they're trying to get everyone to sign up to be a coder, code is not magic. It's just a formal language. It's just logic with some syntax slapped on top of it. It's nothing special. Anybody can do it. So what, this phrase here, this is one of my favorite statements of all time. Time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana. Yeah, totally. Does anyone know who that is? Groucho Marx. Douglas Adams. <laughs> no. no, the precursor to Douglas Adams, Groucho Marx. So this sentence is loaded with magic and ambiguity, right? But when we take a look at this here, this is Python, where there's not really any magic or, ins or you know, anything here, right? This is a list comprehension, and I'm sure most of you in this room don't comprehend what's happening here. So the issue when we're working with art and code is that code allows very little room for ambiguity. We don't have a lot of room to do, to like insert that magic or explore that magic. So when we do encounter some sort of artwork, code-based artwork that does inspire us with that feeling of magic or something, then it is actually truly magic to like sort of force a code base to work against itself in a way to bring out something into the world that's unexpected and, and interesting. So anyway, programmer be programmed. After all this, I've said all this shit talking I've done about web development and MFAs and whatever. Um, programmer be programmed, that is the question. The answer is yes, because the future emerges directly from the objects we design. So the future we want, we need to design that future. If we're artists, we need to be designing the future that we want that is filled with magic. And this is my fa one of my favorite clips from one of my favorite movies from 2001. This is the moment right here. Wait for it. So from the first tools we used, our ancestors were using, to spaceships, it's just a continuum. Technology is just a continuum. We're just immersed in that continuum. Those stone tools to the iPhone, all technology is built on all the previous technologies. And we just insert ourselves into it as hackers and turn it into something else. All right. Thanks. <laughs>